Hello, Australia. I'm Glenn James. Welcome to My Millennial Money. Hi, John. How are you? Good, Glenn. You? Good. You're always well. Oh, couldn't be any other. Yeah. Hey, uh, we've got Paul Benson joining us today. He runs the Financial Autonomy Podcast. Hey, Paul. How are you? Hey, g'day, guys. Thanks oh, for having me well. on. Hey, thanks for being here, Paul. Now, if you're a new listener, well, let's let's just let's back the truck up, John. Yes. If you've been with us for a little while, I just want to say thank you for yes always chiming in, having a listen to us, have a chat. Yeah. Thank you for being part of the M3 community in the Facebook group. Thanks for following us on Instagram. Thanks for telling your friends about what we're doing here. Get a lot of that, don't we? Yeah, because we're just an independent little podcast studio. In a garage. And we're literally in my garage at home. So, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has let us in their ears. Yes. But if you are a new listener, um, my name's Glenn James and this is John. Now, tell us a little bit about you, John. Well, on the spot, Glenn. Uh, Look, I run a property and finance education business. So, uh, been doing that for about five years, property coaching for 10 years, Uh, have an online academy. Um, run corporate workshops and do some one-on-one coaching and anything related to property, basically. Yeah, so if you want, if you're ever interested in using John's services, you can go to solvewealth.com.au um, and he's a good guy. He also has a podcast called My Millennial Property, which is going bangers. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. You're a podcast host. And I personally, I was a financial advisor for over 12 years. I'm not anymore. I'm a full-time podcaster, which is wild to say. It is wild. And I'm having a lot of fun doing what we're doing. Mm. Uh, but we can't do what we're doing without our show partner, Sun Super. So, thank you to Sun Super for sticking by us for some time now. We really uh, appreciate you helping us get this uh, financial message of financial yes. wokeness out to the masses. And Sun Super, they're actually named Super Ratings 2020 Fund of the Year. That's a big so deal. all the super funds in Australia... This year, and they've won a whole heap of other awards. Uh, they are a an award winning super fund, and we just encourage you if you are reviewing your superannuation, mm. make sure to throw Sun Super in the mix. And there's been a lot of people in the Facebook group who have said, "Hey, I've checked out Sun Super and I've joined them. Thanks for you know showing us or telling us about them." Yeah. Well, we can't give you financial advice. We just say, "Hey, throw them in the mix because I don't think you'll be disappointed." No. Nah. Not by the sounds of things, Glenn. No. So, thank you, everybody, for listening. So, you ready to um, Let's do it. turn this up a notch? Yep. All right. Rock and roll. So, Paul Benson, uh, he's now an author. He has got a book called Financial Autonomy, the book that gives you choice. And I know a lot of our listeners love reading and love listening to audio books and whatnot. Uh, so, Paul, talk to us about how this book uh, came about. Yeah, look, thanks, Glenn. It um, it came about, so I've been running a, a podcast called Financial Autonomy for about the last three and a half years, um, which has been a fantastic experience. I, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, and I guess as a consequence of that and, and, you know, getting a little bit of traction on that, I had a, a publisher approach me about, hey, you know, wondered how you'd feel about writing a book. Uh, and I was pretty keen to jump on that opportunity. It was not one that uh, I really saw on the horizon, but uh, but when it got put in front of me, yeah, I was pretty keen to give that one a go. So so that's how we we sort of got to the book. And I guess, as I say, it was the podcast that led to that. And um, and the podcast really came about. I mean, look, I was an avid podcast listener, as I suspect most people that start a podcast probably are. And you think, gee, I'd love to give that a crack. Um, and I guess a bit of a realisation having been a financial planner for for quite a while at that point and working with different people that, you know, some of the sort of the default uh, approach wasn't quite right. You know, we we were sort of, and and Glenn, I'm sure you would have been the same when you were um, training and and learning as well. You know, you'd start off often with people, all right, so when do you want to retire? And, And people generally might have some sort of vague sense, you know, I don't know, 60, 65, something like that. And so, all right, well, then we kind of work back and do strategies. And I guess what I found over time is that actually people might get to that point uh, and then actually, oh, I don't really want to retire after all. I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing or life changes and they end up retiring early or, um, you know, some of the original plans and thoughts maybe they're just not clear enough. And so, um I come to the realization that really what people were after was having the choice, you know. So a, a better way to frame the question rather than when do you want to retire is, look, when do you want to have the option to retire? When do you want to have that choice? And so, you know, we started um, with that sort of focus. 
Um, and then that's, I guess, evolved into, well, what other choices do people want? So, you know, for a lot of the clients that we work with, the choice might be around, um, you know, reducing how many days a week they work when their children are young, for instance. Um, you know, sometimes it's around a career change or, or perhaps moving to self-employment to get a bit more flexibility with life. Um, it could be early retirement in some cases, but uh, often not. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it sort of expanded into, a, I guess, a broader theme around gaining choice so that's sort of how the whole financial autonomy idea came up and and that's how you know the podcast and then most recently the book yeah i love that and i think uh it's one thing that john and i always harp on about you know and if you are again new to the podcast i'd really encourage you like don't have this retirement as this uh date or this age in the future flip it and and put the lifestyle first it's like what do you want your life to look like and then Spot work on. backwards. Yeah, totally. Can I reverse back a bit, Paul? You, you mentioned yep. the the publisher approached you to to write a book. Um, like all retired sports stars, they they write their autobiography, and and anyone that's um, worth their note probably writes a book over time. Um, what what was their reasoning for for thinking that it had some traction to write a book with you, and and what what did you think it was going to be all about? And and has that played out true, I suppose? Yeah, yes. Thanks. So, um, yeah, so Major Street Publishing ap- approached me. Leslie is the, the, the boss there. And uh, so they specialise in personal finance and leadership books. And so Leslie's always, I guess, on the hunt for new authors. Um, and as I say, personal finance is the space that she, she tends to focus on. Uh, and, and I think what she liked was that it was a, a a bit of a fresh approach. You know, there there are a lot of books around about you know how how to invest in shares, for instance, and uh, you know property strategies and these sort of things. But uh, I guess there isn't something maybe that that brings it together quite like uh, we've done with financial autonomy. And um, I guess when we initially discussed, I mean, there wasn't a firm. Here's what the book's going to look like. It was more just kind of sounding me out, and she gave me a bit of feedback on. Here's what you know. Here's where we're seeing demand is, um, and then I sort of pitched. You know, all right. Well, how about we did this? How about you know? What if it looked like this? We, just a few different scenarios, and together. And I guess that was the nice thing with working with a publisher who was experienced in the space is that we were able to sort of find a, um, you know, a, a structure um, that that worked uh, and that aligned very much with with what I'm interested in and, and, and the sort of stuff that we discuss within the podcast. Yeah, it's um, and it's a good – you mentioned structure there. And for me who I don't have the longest attention span, uh, I really liked the – and I've looked through a lot of the book uh, because I helped Paul – I wanted to do a little testimonial or something. Yes, thank you. Very grateful. No, that's right. Uh, Bill's coming. But uh, part one <laughs> – uh, define success. So you've just basically straight out of the gate, the gap, straight out of the gate. It's like, okay, what do you want your life to look like? And then two, yeah. cash flow because that's important. Yeah. Three, investing in stocks. Part four, investing in property, and part five, self-employed. So you can really, um, I think this book is a, a really good start for people if they want to, you know, clear the slate and yeah. start again financially. Yeah, totally. And I thought John's comment to you before, Paul, was a, a, a cheeky jab that I haven't had a book offer yet. Uh, <laughs> I don't, what have I got to do to get a book offer? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're just uh, running around the wrong circles, aren't totally. we? Totally. Mm. But um, <laughs> I'll, I'll make the introduction, guys. I'll see you anyway. <laughs> but it just intrigues me, right? Um, there's so many books out there today on any topic, isn't there? And um, it's like, do we put the cart before the horse? Do we write the book and then go and find a publisher? Like by the sounds of it, the publisher said, well, we think you've got a book in you. We'll, we'll help you write it and we'll make sure it gets published. Yeah, that was the way it unfolded for me. Yeah, and it, and it was good. And, uh, you know, got their feedback along the journey and uh, the team, you know, things like layout and, and you will have seen, Glenn, and I know you didn't get the final version, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of diagrams and that sort of stuff in there as well. So, um, yeah, it was it was very helpful to mm. uh, certainly uh, I, I put the words together, but but it was a team effort to make it all happen for yeah, sure. Nice. Now, is financial autonomy the same as FIRE? Because there's this whole FIRE movement, and for those 
uh, who aren't aware, it stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. And yeah, is it the same thing? Have you just written a fire book? Yeah, thanks, Glenn. That, that's great. And and it look, it, it, I think the original intent with with fire for, for a small segment of the population was really good. Unfortunately, there are some people in the in the fire community that are. Um, it's it's almost like a, a cult or something, and and I think that's pretty off putting for a lot of people. But um, what I hope uh, and believe is that financial autonomy is a lot more uh, realistic, achievable, and applicable to far far more people. So if you, if you break it down, financial it's really two segments, right? Fire is financial independence, and then the retire early piece. Financial independence in its true form means that you've got enough assets, wealth, typically property and shares, that that throws off income such that uh, you don't really have to get out of bed. You, you've got enough income, just passive income, doing nothing uh, to generate all your living costs. Now, that either requires a, an accumulation of a lot of wealth, and to do that, barring an inheritance or a lottery win, would mean that you have to be on a really high income and, and save a lot, uh, or it means living really, really cheaply, um, and maybe it means a bit of both. And most people that doesn't work. Um, it, it doesn't work, particularly if you've got a family uh, and, and children and these type of things. Um, so, so the idea of financial independence, whilst it's it's a great thing to work towards, and maybe later in life it might be something that you can hit, but it's it's not a goal that most people could reach. Whereas when we think about financial autonomy, as I mentioned, it's about gaining choice and. And that choice could be around working three days a week or being self-employed, these sort of things, so that you're still generating income from from some sort of work uh, rather than having to have accumulated, you know, millions of dollars in investment assets. So that's the, the financial independence uh, issue that, that I struggle with and I think most people struggle with, that really that's unattainable. Yeah. And, uh, and then the other element of fire – sorry, Glenn, no, I was no, just no, going to you- say the other element of fire is the retire early – um, and the problem with retire early uh, is that most people, that's not really what they want. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, retirement's potentially boring and it's a waste of your potential. So far better to get yourself in a position where you've got some choice and then you can try your hand at something else if what you're doing job-wise is not making you happy. But I guess you know, retiring early it's, it's not what most people are seeking and even a, a lot of people that claim that they've reached their fire goals or, or you know achieve fire um, in fact they end up going on and doing something else anyway because I mean if we've all got to fill our days so um yeah so look that that's where we're at sorry Glenn you, you were about to say or, oh I, I, no no that's fine I was just going to add like I'm kind of echoing your uh, comments like I I love investing I love having financial independence. Uh, but I guess I think the worst thing about the fire community is they've actually they've missed the the name up because it's not this I'm gonna work 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 uh, be a tight ass not spend any money not be generous and then get to this point where I don't have to work and I can sit on a beach and because you talk to most people who are, quote unquote are in, into fire it's not necessarily about that. I'm going to get to this age and just sit on a beach all day. And I mean, sure, some people can, yeah. uh, but I guess I don't love the the cult and the dogma part of it. And I'm in fire groups on Facebook. I love the chatter. I love all the investment stuff, but I'll challenge those hardcore fire people that they probably don't listen to this podcast anyway, so I can say this, but <laughs> like, do you live a generous lifestyle? Like, or is yeah. it all about the money and a amassing wealth for you because it's that balance where it can get selfish and it can get selfish really fast yeah and i think what i see a lot of and paul you probably do as well is a lot of people want to retire early because they're not enjoying what they do on a day-to-day basis and they're running away from something that uh they they want to avoid essentially so if you if you spin that around and try and find something that they will enjoy more in their nine to five, then the retire early is uh, is is out is laid to bed, isn't it? You, you're in, you're getting the most out of life now. And I think you guys actually illustrate that really well. I mean, say in, in your case, Glenn, you know, you, you're a successful financial planner, and then you went out and started your own business as a financial planner, and then you got into podcasting, found found you were good at it, and you enjoyed it, and, and having fun, and so then 
you know, you're you able to sell your financial planning business and obviously, I don't know your, your financial situation, but you wouldn't have given it away. So, yeah, um, you know, that's then yeah. set you up and allowed you to then pursue the stuff that you love and are passionate about. And, and you know, you're kicking goals with, with I, all I, your podcast I, and it's, I, I, it's very impressive, you know, and, and I think that's a fantastic illustration. Why would you want to retire early? Totally. What you really want is the choice to pursue the stuff that you, you, you enjoy and are having fun with. And, Correct. And it's kind of like I've spent a lot of that money. You have. And <laughs> I've seen it. I can see it's within three <laughs> metres square of me. <laughs> but I mean, like, I- I've just got this thing. It's like life should be full of experiences. Mm. And if I run out of money, I'll just go and make some more. Like, it, I I don't know. And it's probably, um, yeah. But I, it, it takes know. time to realise that, though, I think. Yeah. Like, and there's no age when we do realise it, but we've got to spend enough time in life to realise what's actually important. I don't think we come out of high school knowing what the real importance and the true values that we want to live for the mm. next 40 years are going to be. It devolves over time through our experiences. Yeah. Now, Paul, in the book, you identified, I guess, three pathways to financial autonomy. What are those pathways? Because I'm always curious, like I love personal finance myself, just because no one is above anything. And this is why this podcast, it is just the weekly check-in. It's the weekly encouragement for people. And I'm about to learn something here that I'll apply. And so is John. And so, so is everyone's listening. So, what are the, what are the yeah. three ways? Fantastic. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah. So, so we've identified these three pathways that I guess having, I mean, I've been working with clients for about 20 years now. So, i I've seen lots of different experiences and lots of different journeys. And in fact, in the back of the book, I've got some illustrations of a few different journeys just so that people can get a sense of the different ways that you can achieve financial autonomy. But what I've observed is that pretty well all people will use one and usually two, very often even all three of of these particular pathways. It's either investing in, in stocks or shares, investing in property, or becoming self-employed or some sort of side hustle. And and as I say, often people will combine those. So for instance, they might start investing in shares, build up some wealth, then at some point they sell those shares and that becomes the deposit for their home. And then they build up equity in their home. And then that perhaps then enables them to buy an investment property or become self-employed or these sort of things. So often there's a, a, a trajectory to it and a combination. But I guess what I've seen and observed having having worked with so many people over the years is that those three pathways are, are where it all happens. And so you know, we try and focus on uh, and th- through the book, explaining those three different pathways. And in fact, you might recall, Glenn, we've got in there a few different self-assessment tools. And, and one of the self-assessment tools is to help people identify which of those three pathways is most likely to suit them right now. Uh, again, potentially down the track, there might be another one that they adopt. But for now, let's let's try and get some, some action and, and some things happening. So we try and help people identify which of the pathways is right for them. And then we explore through the chapters uh, how they might go about making a start on that. I, th- I think that's really cool. Just before you go, Glenn, I think so many people come to us and say, uh, do we do property? Do we do shares? Um, do we? Can we run our own business? And, and they're three very different beasts, aren't they? You might not want to do any of them. You might just want to have your own home and live happily ever after. Um, I, th- I think you can combine them all, as you mentioned, but it, it takes a certain risk profile to do all three of them, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah. And particularly, I guess, the self-employment pathway. You know, for some people, that's they love it, but there's plenty of people for whom self-employment doesn't suit at all. So, and I guess that's probably a key thing that we've tried to do with financial autonomy is to to be to be really clear that there's no one right way. I guess, to me, that's just a, an observation I find with other uh, financial-type books that I've picked up is that often they – they sort of have the view that there's only one way and their way is the right way. And I just think in in most things, uh, well, even more broadly in life, but let's just stick to the finances, in most things it's just not right. And so I think you can achieve what you want to achieve and, and everyone's goals are a bit different anyhow, but there are different ways to get there. And, and for some, that solution will be self-employment and that gives them flexibility of hours and, and perhaps that helps with, with family and these sort of things. And then for others, it'll be property investment, John, and you know, getting your input and, and wisdom and, 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 of course, others will go shares. So, yeah, there's different ways to get there. How many times do you, you, you find some guy or gal online yeah. and they spray this paragraph of, 
oh, you need to do it this way. You do no, no, no. Yeah. The right way is your way. There's actually no right way. No, and I think, Correct. as Paul mentioned, a lot of books and, and data out there with um, big one way, this is the only way, but it's really just to sell that particular product, isn't it? Like that that's the aim of it. So <laughs> sometimes so uh, going the, the normal logical way is quite boring. Yeah, spot on, John. Great observation for sure. Yeah, and I like the Glenn James spending plan that I do, my goal for that online course is for people to learn one thing, apply it to their life and hopefully outgrow it because yeah. I just want to teach broad concepts and then people can adapt those concepts to whatever their situation is. Yeah, get the next generation. Now, I'm just looking at the self-assessment um, in the book. So, you talk about the cash flow management. So, the cash flow management is kind of the, the beating heart of the financial autonomy. Uh, so, you've got things like, I'm a detailed or oriented person. Um, you know, you, you like precise answers and you can select like, that's me somewhat or that's definitely not me. And if you're worried, if you're a details orientated person, think to yourself or ask your partner or spouse when you get home, hey, what's your mobile phone plan? And the people who say, oh, I'm on the Telstra $28 prepaid and I got two gig of data, they're probably more detailed orientated. <laughs> but if they said, what, if you say, John, what's your phone plan? <laughs> and um, you said to Amy, oh, I don't know. Like it's, yeah. that's, that's a good gauge. I always ask the phone plan thing. Yeah, there you go. Or remembering that's phone That's a great numbers. test. Yeah. And then, you know, there's some self-assessment things. It's like the, your main goal around paying off debt, uh, if you like to focus on the big picture, if you're time poor, uh, if you're great with a spreadsheet. So, it really is a practical book. And the one thing I would say about Paul's book, uh, first and foremost, one, Paul did not pay a cent to come on here. No. Uh, I invited him on. Uh, but number two, I always like a book that's been written by a, a tradesperson because yes. they've had the practical experience um, rather than I've got an opinion on this. And I haven't had that much practical experience mm. and this is what I think. And it's just chalk and cheese. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And he's got a great voice for podcasting, hasn't he? I remember when he <laughs> interviewed me last year on the podcast here, he, uh, uh, it's got a great voice. Are you saying he's not good looking? Thank you, John. Uh, no, no, no. That wasn't a backhanded compliment. <laughs> I think that is what he's saying. No, yeah. no. Even, even better head for YouTube. Yeah. So, <laughs> Paul, you know, we all want money, most of us. Because mm -hmm. money gives us options. But why in society is the focus on amassing wealth and getting rich? Like, why should that be just thrown out? It's funny, you know. I don't think that is the driver or the motivation for the vast majority of people. And I wouldn't imagine most of the, the My Millennial Money wise listeners, it would be their goal either. So, it is curious that- Well, there's a, well, there's a whole yep. Instagram um, tracking ad that's following me around with the guy in front of a jet uh, with a Ferrari. Like, what's with that? It just sc screams credibility, doesn't it? Yeah, totally. I see those Jack sometimes Ma. as well. It, yeah. it, it is really interesting, isn't it? I, as I say, it, 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 it baffles me that, yeah, a lot of the content around is seems to be focused on you becoming the next uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or something, and yet I don't think that the vast majority of people in any way aspire to that. So, uh, you know, that's a key um you know, a key thought, I guess, with financial autonomy, and we touch on it in the book again, uh, that it ties back to this idea of gaining choice, that actually most people, even if initially they think, oh, what I want is a million dollars in the bank, not really. They've come at that because that's sort of what they've been conditioned to to try and shoot towards. But really, the million dollars in the bank is just to enable them to do something, whatever that is, you know, travel for 12 months or a million dollars is going to get you a lot further than that. But you know what I mean? It's it's They've got something that they really want to do. There's something in the circumstance they're in right now that they want to change. And so they've they've put a number to that. And that's good. But it's far more important to actually be clear on what those changes are that you're trying to to aspire to uh, and then work directly towards those rather than kind of have this tangent happening where where oh, my objective is to be as rich as possible or yeah have the Ferrari or the private jet or whatever completely unnecessary thing is there that's probably not going to make you any happier at all and, and 
Mm. probably even more stress because most people that have those have probably got dead up to their eyeballs. And you mentioned before that our listeners probably aren't that type, and, and I probably agree with you, but it's there's more, um, call it crap out there now than there's ever been because of online um, – the, the ability to get so much traction online with with stuff so people only promote the the good in their life online so you can be wrapped up in thinking well why haven't I got that or why aren't I doing that or why aren't I um, sitting on a boat right now so I think there's a lot more pressure on people to maybe aspire to something that they might not even want because of what's happening online yeah, that's a good observation. And I mean, I know you guys are, are you know, YouTubers and, and, and shooting the lights out there. And um, there's there's one I follow, Sailing La Vagabond. I don't know if you've seen it. You mentioned sailing there, John. Uh, and, and they present a pretty idyllic life most of the time. But occasionally they do talk about the fact that, hey, sometimes we feel miserable uh, and feel guilty because we feel miserable because we're on a boat and it's the sunshine and we shouldn't. And I think it's great when some of those – uh, aspirational type uh, content producers actually do provide a little bit of the behind the scenes and a bit of reality on on, on how things look. Mm, totally. Now, Paul, do you have children? Yes, two two teenage boys. And how – I'm just kind of now just going well, – because I, I think we've covered the book. Everyone, just buy the bloody book. It's good. Um, <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I hate right. being on script. Um how how are you teaching your uh, kids, teenage boys, about money? Well, I think the main thing we've done is just that they've got to earn it. And look, my oldest is in year 12 at the moment, so we've been a bit flexible on that. I mean, there is a bit more just handing out a bit of cash because we want him to focus on his studies. But generally, the boys have an awareness that if they want a bit of cash, and we give them a little bit of pocket money to get them started, but beyond that, uh, they need to earn it. And they're fortunate that that both my wife and I have our own businesses. So there's a few opportunities there. So my youngest son, I mean, he delivers pamphlets, so he, he picks up a bit of cash that way anyhow. But if he really wants to get something and he doesn't have enough cash, he, he can usually come into my office and do a bit of shredding or something and uh, pick up a bit of cash that way. And and my older son, uh, at times, he, he edits the podcast for me and can earn a bit of money that way. He's got a part-time job as well, although not happening right at the moment due to COVID. But um, so for us, really, it's been about the boys just appreciating that when they want something, it's not just, hey, you know, dad, can you give me 50 bucks? It's, hey, dad, what can I do to get 50 bucks? Um, and and that's, that's worked pretty well for us. And I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't know, it's be so mean and stingy and, you know, dole out every five cents. But but I think just having an appreciation that money just doesn't fall from the sky like rain mm. uh, is good and, and, and that seems to have worked. I think the boys have got a pretty good appreciation. And just uh, two things on that. Number one, uh, the part-time work shredding in your office, is that before like an ATO audit or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, don't answer that. You've been there before, Glenn. You no, 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 no not at all. Uh, number two... <laughs> You know, I thought I was finished with your bloody book, but it just popped up again with the bank account structures because you've got a heap of diagrams and budgeting styles in the book. How are you uh, suggesting that the boys structure their bank accounts? Because you talk about different styles of budgeting. And again, there's yep. no one budget style that fits all. It's just whatever works for you. So, did you say, look, these are some options or are you saying, hey, this has worked for me and this is why I suggest you use that? What are they doing with their own personal banking structures? Look, we haven't got into a lot of detail um, with that at this point. My youngest son has ended up, he's got two bank accounts and I, I can't really recall how that happened. I think maybe we opened one and then he wanted a, 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 an ATM sort of access or something. But anyway, that kind of works for him because he sort of has one as a savings account and, and one as his spending account. Um, my older son, to the best of my knowledge, just has the one account, but he does have, for his, he, he turned 18 a few months back and we... we um, Got him onto the, the the Comsec pocket. You guys have no doubt seen that. Yep, um, it's yep. just a way you, you can buy shares for two bucks a trade. You know, you buy fifty dollars worth of shares and this sort of stuff. So for his eighteenth, we we gave him some money to buy some shares and just said, all right, we'll we'll go at it. You know, you, there's only seven that you can choose from there ETFs. Uh, so you have a bit of a look and you decide which ones you want to buy and and go for it. And uh, luckily for him, he did it in February just before COVID hit. So uh, I imagine he's probably still underwater, but that's not a bad learning to have early on in your investment journey either. So, um, yeah, so that's what we've done to date. 
So while we're on the topic of kids, Paul, uh, I had this conversation in our office yesterday about um, vocational options for kids when they're leaving school and and, uh, I suppose the pathway has been sit down with you careers advisor slash teacher uh, at the end of year 10 or 11 and so what do you want to be son or daughter and and uh, and then go and and hit that direction or maybe follow what mum or dad has done I think there's so much more to it and um, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on what you're advising especially your, your older son mate I can tell you it's really hard because he, he's got a couple of different ways that he could go in terms of what he studies at, at uni. He's intending to go to uni next year and they're quite different and I really just want him to decide and come on, mate, what are you doing? You're going to have to make these choices soon. Like literally I think he's got to make the choices in a few weeks' time and he yeah. still doesn't really know. And I, I try and just pull myself back that that me putting pressure on doesn't really help the situation. Yeah. Um <laughs> And I guess re- recognizing that when when I was doing year twelve, I didn't really have too much of a clue what I wanted to do either. Uh, and so I'm trying to chill and just let it happen. But I have to say, I find it quite difficult. He doesn't have a really clear direction on what he wants to do. And Ethan, he's probably going to edit. No, oh, in fact, no, he's not going to edit this episode. So <laughs> he can if he wants. Well, he's talking well, the other way around. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and and I I don't think he would be on his own. Like the, a lot of kids would be in the same boat of not knowing what they want, and they could potentially get down two years into a uni degree that are, they don't like. And listeners can probably um, uh, agree with a lot of it. Here is okay. Now I change degrees, or I stop uni altogether, or I don't go to uni, but maybe I should have, and I go to TAFE, or I get an, an apprenticeship. Like. It's all too confusing or, or maybe we're not um, putting enough time into it or we're not old enough to decide what it is that we want at that age. Yeah. I mean, one of his options, and, and this is, was the option I took as well, is to do a business degree on the basis that at least that's quite broad. Uh, and I mean, there's different facets of that, whether you do marketing or economics or whatever, but nevertheless, they're pretty broad skills. It's not like you're training to be a, a dentist or something quite specific. And so maybe then that's a way that you can then find your feet a little bit further down the road. I don't know, John, maybe yeah. that's one way to go. Interesting. Well, interesting. We recently did a, a careers webinar with Shell and M who host our podcast, uh, My Millennial Career. And someone asked the question about uh, like a master's degree or like a master's level and doing a degree and Shell said who's in HR pretty high up in HR she said if she was doing her time again she'd probably just do an MBA because it's the most flexible mm. so yeah good point speaks yeah. to um interesting now Paul um who plays the guitar in the background of your screen yeah, that's my oldest son. Yeah, uh, I wish I could say I was that cool, but I'm not. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you can't see it, but there's a whole drum kit at the end too. Oh, so wow. there's quite a bit of, we've got a bass guitar somewhere else in the house. My other son plays bass. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of music in the household. Nice orange cabs there. Now, yeah. let's talk about shares and investing. What's your personal investment philosophy? I, I go a core satellite type approach. Um I have. Have you guys explored Corsa? Corsa well, like actually, in previous at, yeah, episodes? at the time of uh, us recording this, this is on a Tuesday. Today's episode, uh, we did it with the Equity Mates uh, podcast. Yeah, beautiful. And we Price actually and touched on um, the Core Satellite approach. So, yes, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, so so that that's certainly how I approach things. So w- we would use a core of, of ETFs. Uh, like, say, for instance, our super fund is set up this way, core of ETFs, and then you have a few satellites um, of some other interesting ideas that you just want to have a bit of a, a bit of a crack at, but the satellites aren't big enough that if, if it doesn't work out or, or even worse, it goes disastrously, they're not going to totally torpedo the portfolio. So, And I probably would say that if, if one day I'm... I don't know, putting the feet up somewhere, then then I probably wouldn't even worry about those satellites. I'd, I'd just go, you know, ETF type, broad, broadly diversified investments um, and sleep pretty easy. Um, you know, individual shares are good and I do have some in the portfolio as those satellites. It's, it's interesting, but really your goal is to get that market type return, that sort of 7 to 10% return and I know if I can if I can average that over the long term, then I'm going to get to where I need to be. So it's not to, I'm not investing to, to to gamble and take a punt. Um, 
I just want to get as sure outcome as I can. And, and so that sort that uh, core satellite approach works pretty well, I think. And what type of, because um, I know on the podcast episode when I talked about my own um, investing or trade account uh, in my family trust, I probably run a, a 90-10 core satellite. Uh, what type of percentage range do you have personally? Oh, I'm at about 60-40. Yeah, a little um, bit more aggressive yeah, than the old Glennie yeah, James over here. I should, should just, you know... Caution that, of course. The fact that that's right for me doesn't mean it's right for you. And I know you'll do all the normal disclosures, Glenn. But yeah, uh, yeah just to flag that. Yeah, because it's interesting. Because mm. I, the, it's funny. Like I wasn't before I started this podcast. My whole focus, day in day out, was a small business owner just dealing with clients. I didn't have the headspace to be an active type, or quote unquote, active investor. Mm. I'd already, I had an interest, but starting this podcast for me. I've really got more encouraged about investing yeah. and like I did not have a, uh, a trading account until like six, seven months ago right. because I was just, my head wasn't there. But now I'm, you know, back, I've got my trading account. Uh, I bought some shares the other day, like a very small parcel within that 10% in a company. And th this is my first individual stock that I've purchased for bloody oh, 10 or 12 years. Um, because of the personal interest. But you're also probably not focusing on everyone else's finances. You, you've got time to f focus on your yeah, own. Yeah, and that, and that was, you know, when you are an advisor, like you've got all these clients yeah. and you're talking about their investments every day. That's but right. it's like, oh, hang on, I enjoy this. So, and what uh, what's your view? Do you hold uh, residential or commercial investment property yourself as an investment asset class? Yeah, I've, I've got one of each. So, we've got the... Uh, uh, the office that, that the financial planning practice works out of, um, which is through our, our self-managed super fund. And then, uh, yeah, we've also got a, a, an apartment as well, a, an investment property, a 1960s, 1970s apartment in the, in, the, in the city as well. And I didn't mean for this episode to be a colonoscopy into Paul's financial life, but I think it's just um, <laughs> interesting to learn about other professionals mm. and the way they manage money. Now, and it's not an insult, but you know, Paul's been an advisor for a million years. He hasn't got this crazy high risk, complex, busy, you know, there's moving parts. It's pretty boring yeah. and it's just yeah. ticking along and it's doing the job. Yeah. And, and, uh, and hopefully also it illustrates that you don't have to be just property or just shares. No. Um, and as I say, we've got the three pathways is owning a business and being self-employed as well. But um, some people seem to feel that they have to fly a flag and, and, and declare themselves in one camp or the other. And it's just not true. Well, we've got to pull John away from the property a little bit. I reckon we've got to get him set up a little uh, little uh, brokerage account and, <laughs> hey, and get I, him to I, I check my shares more often than I check my property. Do you? Absolutely. Yeah, right. Because I can see you the know, value. That's because you can. I, can. I can see the green or the red every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's <laughs> and um, if, if you know, in your, I guess, professional life, if you could put like, you know, the one myth that, you know, when you sit down with, because uh, most of your clients in the financial planning practice, would you say Gen X? So, in that 40s? Yes. Yep. That's right. If there's one myth that you keep, I guess, you know, busting over the last, you know, 10, 20 years of being a financial advisor... Do you think there's this one thing that you would like to say is that's just categorically not true or just a couple of themes that we can tell people? I think a lot of people are embarrassed that they don't have a budget that tracks every dollar that they spend. And yet I reckon 1% of the population actually has that. But it's funny that a lot of people have the perception that everyone else does that and I'm the, I'm the odd one out that I've just got no idea about money. Is so that most Paul, people Paul, don't have really detailed budgets and know every cent. Yeah, Paul, is that because 1% of the population are engineers? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> and hello to all the engineers listening. Yeah. I, I, yeah so, so that's certainly one that I see. Sorry, John. Yeah, no, I actually agree with you. I think there's... There's a there's a difference between knowing broadly how much you're spending each month and how much is coming in versus tracking every absolute dollar, though, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I mean, as myths probably, as I mentioned before, there's there's a myth that you have to declare yourself as either a property person or a share person, and I don't believe that's true. Um, sometimes too, it's around. 
couples aren't always on the same page with their finances. John, you probably see this a bit. Um, and and that's quite normal. But people don't, you know, think that they're the only ones where husband and wife disagree or, or, or you can't quite don't have the same vision for the future. John, uh, oh, Glenn in particular, I guess, you've probably come across that back in the day as well. Yeah, the, and I've said it before on the podcast, like I used to do an activity with um, a couple where they, they would both have a bit of paper and we've done this live on the podcast before when we've had couples where we both, we get them to write down their top three priorities and then we do the reveal and it's not going to be the equal three on either parts of the paper, but at least if there's one common thing between the six goals, like, let's start there. Like, uh, but again, I, yeah, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm not really an expert in this relationship business, so I'm going to move, <laughs> move along right now. Well, I think one thing I'd say with that uh, couple stuff, Paul, is if you've got two money-driven individuals that are in a relationship together can be quite dangerous. I'm thankful that my wife couldn't give a crap about money and um, to come and go as, as, it, as it needs to and I'm not trying to make a million dollars but I'm not trying to spend a million dollars either. So, yeah, I don't know how your situation is but I, I think um, you, you make it work whatever you've got. Yeah, no, you're right. It's nice to compliment one another, isn't it, if, you, if you're fortunate enough to be in that situation. Paul, what does your wife do? What's her small business or big business? I don't want to. So she has. Well, it's small and right at the moment, it's it's extremely small due to COVID. But yes. she, she has a, a touring a tour business, so she takes people on tours, uh, uh, some walking tours, historic walking tours, and shopping tours, and these sort of things around Melbourne. So, oh, cool. uh, yeah, t- completely smashed by by COVID. Mm. And um, in fact, they do some tours, uh, sporting type stuff. You know, the MCG and. Uh, some of that type of stuff as well. So the, their busiest period is is the um, spring racing carnival, spring, yeah. sort of Novemberish, yeah. and I mean that's just not going to happen at all this year. So yeah. uh, it's a bit frustrating. So she's got a she, she's got a twelve seater bus, and uh, that's just sitting out the front. I saw it the other day with a whole lot of bird poo on it because it hasn't moved for yeah. weeks. And um, yeah, but anyway, look, that's what she, that's what she does ordinarily, and, and yeah, she really enjoys it. Yeah, great. Now, if there was someone listening right now and. They've got a, a meeting with a mortgage broker in a couple of weeks, or they're looking to buy their first house. What would you say that they would look at in terms of the mortgage structure? And I'm sorry that this episode is just a bit all over the place, but I just want to have a bit of a chat with Paul and ask him random questions. And yeah. <laughs> you don't pay for this podcast, everyone, so you don't have to listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look. Uh- I'd have to say that's probably not my strength, Glenn. I mean, I, I guess you'd look, you'd want to look at the interest rate and the regular fees, uh, flexibility. I mean, you definitely want an offset account. Um, to be honest, the bloke sitting next to you there, John's quite possibly got better insight than me. Yeah, but what would he know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I suppose you answering that when when it's not your specialty, you've had life experience in that respect. You've had life experience with property, shares, running a business, getting your own finances in order. And that's, I think, the biggest tick you can have, isn't it, uh, when, you're, when you're coaching someone else or dealing with someone else's um, finances. Um, you've just shown us the experience right there and then. Yeah, thank you. Now, anything else you want to um, tell our listeners, Paul? Oh, well, look, uh, what I'd love is for him to buy the book, uh, Financial Autonomy, the money book that gives you choice. Um, of course, it's uh, it's available online and ebook and Kindle and all those different things. Um, but if, you, if you're if you after a, a physical copy, uh, what I'd suggest is jumping onto financialautonomy.com.au slash book. Uh, and in that way, you'll be buying it direct from us. And if you do that, then you don't have to pay any postage. So it's free postage within Australia uh, rather than us. Uh, giving Amazon or whoever their their cut, we're, cut we're putting the middle, that into the postage instead. Well, so, I, I was going to say that we'll put a link in the show notes. Um, yeah, I usually put a Booktopia link, Paul, so I can get a uh, a one percent uh, <laughs> affiliate link. But just send me <laughs> just send me some cash in the mail once the uh, once the sales come through. So, will do, mate. I'll send you those five cent commissions. <laughs> Love it. But yeah, I, I would really encourage anyone uh, to read the book. And are you going to do an audio version of the book? Not locked in, probably in 2021. It doesn't exist at the moment. Um, 
Yeah, well, it, not totally decided on that at this point. I guess it depends how the book goes. Mm, interesting. How long, Paul, would have taken you to compile from start to finish, do you think? I did most of the writing over the Christmas holidays uh, at the start of this year. Um, it's it's a tough one, you know, because then you, you sort of come back to it and then you do bits and pieces and then you get feedback from the editor and you do more. But I, I would think if you added it all up, it's it's probably – two to three months right. of work. But, I mean, that wouldn't be eight hours a day, of course. But, yeah, it's a tough one to answer, John, but it certainly it took a while. And, yeah, I mean, we started the process in December last year and we're in August now and it's just coming out. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of cool. of how long these things take to come together. Yeah. twenty nine ninety five is that the one? That's the one. Love Beautiful. it. Love it. Tell Paul that uh, M3 sent you. And he'll give you a discount, yeah, which is free postage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, do you want to hang around for the community member of the week, Paul? For sure. All right, all right, Dan, you are up. Dan, thank you for listening to My Millennial Money. Thank you for being part of the My Millennial Money community. Uh, Dan's a twenty-six-year-old uh, dude from Geelong. Now, Paul, can you guess his occupation? I don't know, chiropractor. <laughs> what? Did Jess send you this before? <laughs> Did she? No. Well, you bloody guessed it. There you go. Paul, the, I'm going to ask you, guess his occupation and just kind of think and go, I don't know, chiropractor. Okay, say that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Put this in the bloopers for sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> Shut up, everyone. Shout wow. out, Dan. Nailed it. Wow, that's amazing. Oh. That's, he's, okay. he's got more talents than we thought. That's right. He can bloody write books and read minds. Uh, but Dan's money goal is uh, buying a first home. Uh, medium-term goal uh, is to own his own practice in three to five years and uh, 10 to 15 years is to buy a farm. So, th- that's a good um, one, Paul. Like, So, I love Dan's um, vision because he's got short, medium and long. And yep. I think that's always good because he's always got intent. He's always got, I always like to say, one eye on today, one eye on the future. Like, And then if something changes, you know, it's not going to be crazy for him to pivot. No. I love the yeah, farm. I love it. Mm, mm. And, and this is amazing as well. Uh, how he's achieving that goal, currently 40% of his income goes to saving for his house deposit. Nice. Yeah, good. Good yeah. tracking his savings rate too. Yeah. Love that. The silliest money mistake he's made, not traveling or working much while at uni. Uni breaks were spent working in shearing sheds and harvest. So that money, um, so I had money for the term. Now I feel like he's missed out on overseas travel. But <laughs> I did exactly the same thing, Dan. I was sharing your pain. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. Like, this is what I would say to you, Dan. Like, and I'll get Paul's comment on it as well. Because, you know, you clearly, I'm making the assumption that you don't have consumer debt. You're saving a heap of money. Once you get that big chunk of buying your first home, because you've got the habits and behaviors in place, you still be able to make bank. And once you've got that big rock in your life, maybe then go, okay, I'm having three months off. I'm going to go and do a big banging travel trip uh, once this COVID stuff settles down. So, I, I don't think all is lost. And I really think... Um, Dan, like even if you're 29 years old, like you're 26 now, if you're 29 or 30 and then decide to do a big banging holiday, you're still going to be the envy of all your friends because they're not going to have money and they're not going to have the options that you've got because you've been disciplined um, today. So, I, while you say it's a money mistake, I would say don't be that hard on yourself, Dan. Yeah, he's probably just trying to come up with one because he hasn't really got one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, do you want to comment on on this situation or anyone out there who's got some maybe regrets or ambitions? Well, that's interesting because I would have thought the answer really for Dan is instead of buying the house in three years, buy it in four years and and, and go for a three-month trip in between. Um, I mean, it's not going to – once you take on a mortgage, the inclination then, particularly given y- y- your great savings rate and it seems like your natural focus on finances, I-, I would be amazed if once you get the mortgage, your focus doesn't turn to what I want to do is pay off the mortgage, right? And that mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense given your other goals because then you're going to have equity in your house to be able to do those other things that you want to do. So that being the case, I, I-, I suspect you're going to – if you haven't been able to justify taking an overseas trip up to this point, I th- 
think it's going to be even less likely once you take a mortgage. So maybe you could just push that goal back one year. In the grand scheme of things, it's not going to make any difference. Uh, and and go and have three months and travel around and do what you want to do. Um, you know, you're only young once. Get on with it, I reckon. Well, that's interesting. So slightly different to mine. Now, what are you going to say, John? Buy an investment property in RentVest? No, I'd, oh. I'd buy the farm sooner rather than later. Really? Get that long term. Uh, yeah. But uh, the far, oh, that's another discussion for another day, buying a, um, a big property asset like that, isn't it? Well, it doesn't have to be big. I mean, there's very, there's, there's a hundred different versions of, uh, of acreage, but yeah, it depends what you want and the lo- location that you want to buy it. But yeah, I think the biggest thing I see with goals and, and I'm, I'm not one for shutting down someone's goal. They, they own it. But if we, if we say 15 years, I want a farm, can we make that eight years or nine years, what's actually saying it's going to take us 15 years? Can we get it sooner than we actually realize? Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's good. And I think as well, like when, and I'm just reflecting on myself as a 26-year-old when I was 26, I think when we we haven't been in the workforce for a good 10 years and really understand, once you're starting to earn a decent income, you'll be able to get things sooner than what you thought. Totally. I would yeah. imagine. I don't yeah. know what you think about that, Paul. Mm, yeah, no, quite right. And mm. particularly, I mean, if he ends up being a, a part owner in the chiropractic practice, then you'd imagine his, his income there, he can choose to work extra or, or, or whatever. You'd imagine he could scale up his income a bit there too. Mm. So, yeah, you might be able to accelerate things. Now, finally, Paul, your PR people, a.k.a. yourself, um, <laughs> you, I, I, I'm, I'm going to do something bold here and I'm going to say – um, Paul has been kind enough to donate a copy of his book to Dan. Yeah, great idea. Absolutely. Yeah, great Let me know idea. his address. We'll sort it out. Yeah. yeah. So, Dan, and if John. you if you are listening to this, uh, send me a LinkedIn, oh, bloody LinkedIn, whatever it is, Instagram or- um, Or LinkedIn. Or LinkedIn, whatever. <laughs> Just reach out to us somehow and say, I'm Dan the Cairo and we'll, we'll get your book and- uh, you know, Paul's in COVID and if you can't stretch it, I'm sure John and I will chip in some money to get sure, that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can get there. <laughs> no worries. All right. It's been great. You can uh, jump on, buy Paul's book through the link in the show notes or uh, Google Financial Autonomy and check out the podcast Financial Autonomy. Awesome, Paul. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.